Good. Welcome to Southcrest, man. We are glad that you are here. Thank you for worshiping, man. That was a, an incredible time of just, man, lifting up songs to the Lord. Uh, we are in the middle of our sermon series called Gather and Go. I really hope that you've been enjoying it over the past few weeks where we've just been spending time talking about the vision that God has given to us as a church in how we are going to fulfill the Great Commission, right? The mission comes from Jesus, and then the question becomes, how are we going to make disciples? And that is our vision. Now, before we get into it, um, as a pastor, my prayer for us as a church is this is I have this burning, burning desire and passion and hope that all of us in here, that our hearts would begin to stir towards our calling and our purposes in this vision, all right? That God would burn anew and afresh in your heart like never, ever before, and that he would burn in your heart so strongly that there's nothing that you can't do but respond to it. Okay, and so that's my hope. My hope is that that maybe you've been a Christian for many, many, many years, and uh, maybe that fire, so to speak, has gone out. Maybe it's gone dormant, and maybe you have sat back, and maybe you've just been coasting. My prayer for you is that that fire would begin to rekindle in your heart. And for some of you in here, maybe you've never given your life to Christ ever before, and so I'm asking that you uh, would surrender your life to, to Jesus and that he would make you alive as well. So that's my heart, man. My heart is that God would just be, would create revival in our hearts. That's what I want, and a revival here within our church as well. And so uh, in your seats, you got cards, and so hopefully you've been enjoying these, and uh, would love for you to follow along for the next 25 or 30 minutes or so. And uh, man, I, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm, I'm really, really excited. Today is all about spiritual growth, but I want to recap like we do every week and uh, just kind of pick up and kind of build on the past couple of weeks of where we're at. And so starting with our vision, Many of you should be able to say it by now, but our vision is engaging our communities through gospel, grace, and growth relationships. This is where we're going to put our effort. This is where we're going to put our focus and all of our energies. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time uh, talking through this because we've already talked about it a good bit, but as a quick recap, God has placed you within communities in your life. It is not by accident. It's intentional. God has given you passions and desires and abilities, and, and, and you work in a, in, a, in a specific field, and you, have, um, you, know, you live in a specific area, and your, our role in these areas, in these communities, is to be uh, an impact for the kingdom of God and to share the gospel and to help people that are in need and to grow with believers, and that's what it is. So we want to engage in the communities wherever God has placed us, through the relationships that we build and have. That's simply it, right? We talked last week about, uh, you know, so God says, go make disciples. So what are we going to do? Are we going to go buy a bullhorn and a Turner burn sign and stand on the street corner? Or are we going to more utilize the relationships and the locations that maybe God has placed us in intentionally, okay? So we said focus on three relationships. Who is one person in your life that doesn't know the Lord, who is one person in your life that is hurting or broken, that's in need, that you can extend some unmerited favor, some grace to, some help to? And then who can you grow spiritually with in relationship, all within the communities that God's placed you in, right? So last week, we talked about the gospel relationship, right? The, we, we put the whole day on that focus. And so talked a lot about uh, many different things, but just to recap a couple of things. Number one, why do we share the gospel? I, I, like, I like talking about the, the why question because it's simple. It boils it down. Why do we share the gospel? Last week we talked about it. We said that the gospel, sharing the gospel is the responsibility of every believer. It's not just the responsibility of the preacher or the minister that's on staff. All of us, it's our responsibilities as believers. And we talked about that out of Corinthians, how if you've been reconciled to Jesus, congratulations, you now have the ministry of reconciliation, right? So if you've been saved by the gospel, you have a responsibility to share that gospel, right? And then number two, the obvious is that a relationship with Jesus brings new life. 
we used the illustration last week, the pen and Teller thing, and, and, and I posed the question, like, man, how much do we have to hate somebody not to share the hope of Jesus Christ with somebody? Anybody that's walking around on the earth that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus is walking in spiritual blindness. They are spiritually dead. And we have the hope. We have the light inside of us. And so, man, we need to share this. And we need to be passionate about it. And if we're not broken for the lost in our lives, man, listen, we, we need to ask God for that burden. That God, would you give me a burden for the lost that, that I would desire to see my friends, my families, and my coworkers, all of those people that are in my communities, come to know the Lord. And then we talked a little bit about how. Man, how do we share the gospel? And I brought my whiteboard out again, so you guys are in trouble again. And so, uh, you know, we talked about this Engel scale for a few minutes last week, right? We talked about how it's a journey to Jesus, right? It's a journey to Jesus. And so not to spend a ton of time on this either, but we primarily focused on this side, right? So to share the gospel, all of this is evangelism, right? And typically people don't go from no interest in Christ all the way to boom, placing their faith in Jesus. Now, God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. But most of the time it is a journey to Jesus, right? This is a journey to Jesus. And so a lot of times somebody who's not even interested in Christ or, not, you know, no awareness or just going about their life, something happens, a crisis, whatever, they become spiritually curious, they're introduced to the gospel, maybe you come along in their life and begin to show them the gospel, right, and then they're just trucking along here, right? It's a journey to Jesus. It says that God draws people. Paul says that he's, he plants Apollos waters, but to God the increase. Yet again, this image of this, this journey. And so, man, oh gosh, I'm a sinner uh, and I need a savior. Well, no, I don't like that. So maybe there's even a regression for a moment. Okay, no, so I'm not good in and of myself. I get it. So, so all the way, there's no other name under heaven and earth that man can be saved. So I got to place my faith in Jesus. Okay, boom, place their faith in Jesus, right? It's a journey to Jesus. And so that's what we talked about uh, last week. And then we talked about start with your story. How do we share the gospel? Start with what Jesus did in your life, okay? If you don't know the Romans road or some type of end time eschatology stuff, you know, that's okay. Just start with your story. Nobody can argue with what Jesus has done in your life. Hey, I was once this way, but now by God's grace, I'm this way. Thank you, God. And then I always say, you know, stick with what you know. There's a lot of questions, a lot of deep questions that people will ask. And if you don't know the answer, it's okay. You can say, I don't know, but let me get that answer for you. So don't ever be afraid to share the gospel with your friends and your communities, okay? And so that's what we touched on a little bit uh, last week. And so today, like I said, you know, this is all based around growth. Growth is a massive part of our vision, but more importantly, spiritual formations or spiritual maturity, right, or spiritual growth, however you want to say it, is a vital part of our Christian life, our Christian faith, okay? We are designed to grow, and we're going to get into that here in just a minute. But I want to make a point. Before we were called to go and make disciples, we were invited to come and be a disciple, You and I, we enrolled, we accepted Christ, and we are disciples. Now, those aren't mutually exclusive, so don't hear me say that. We're to go and make disciples. That's a part of being a disciple. But when you look at that word disciple, one of the greatest definitions I love is to enroll as a student. To enroll as a student, right? You are you are at Jesus University. Jesus is your professor, and you're a school, you're a student sitting in class, and he is going to teach you for the rest of your life. Now, going and making disciples, like I said, is all a part of it, but I don't want us to lose the fact that all of us are in process. None of us have arrived, right? Everyone is in process. And so you could think about it like this: there's the outer part of you, and there's the inner part of you, right? So talking about the outer part of you, our bodies, it's being shaped all the time by the the things that I eat, right? I like ice cream. I specifically like Jenny's ice cream. Yes, it's extravagantly expensive. I understand that, but it is the ice cream that rules them all. It is the best of the best, okay? So don't even come at me. Don't even send me an email. They're the best. Jenny's ice cream 
is the best. Now, it's like $7 for a little bit, so I eat on it for many days. I just, I, I savor it, okay? It takes me maybe five days to eat that little pint. But man, there's a, there's a spiritual moment as I'm eating this ice cream, right? But all of that is shaping my body and shaping my, the outer me and, and the things that I drink and the sleep that I get or the exercise that I do or don't do, for better or for worse, my external is being shaped, right? Same with the internal. Your spirit man, your spiritual formation is being shaped all the time by the things you see, by the things you hear, by the things that you do, the community that you surround yourself in. It is all forming your spiritual life for the better or for the worse. And so the reality is, is that God desires for us to grow. He desires for us to grow. And so back to this angle scale thing, you know, last week we talked primarily this side of the scale. Okay, and so once we place our faith in Christ, the Bible says that we're infants, that we're, we're little children. Like we have to grow up, right? We have to work out our, our salvation through fear and trembling. And all of this is this journey of being a disciple. This is a journey with Jesus, okay? And this is all sanctification. This is a work that he does in our hearts and in our lives. And so, man, when I place my faith in Jesus, my first step is baptism. We just saw that, right? We just saw baptism. So if you're in here as a believer and you haven't taken that first step of faith, that is a part of your spiritual formation. That's a part of your growth. And then you get into a church, right? You, you join Christian community. You begin to study God's word. You begin to pray. You begin to understand basic Christian doctrine and, and your character begins to sh- be shaped and all and on and on, right? This whole process will happen for the rest of your life. We don't ever arrive over here, right? It's a process, and I want to prove that to you in Philippians 3 briefly. This is Paul talking, Philippians 3, and and this is in a a really neat translation that I really, really like, but uh, Philippians 3 says this, Yet, my brothers, I do not consider myself to have arrived spiritually, nor do I consider myself already perfect, but I keep on going grasping ever more firmly that purpose for which Christ grasped me. But I keep going on, grasping ever more firmly that purpose for which Christ grasped me. My brothers, I do not consider myself to have fully grasped it even now, but I I do concentrate on this, two things. I leave the past behind me, and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. I love this, man. Paul, hands down, one of the greatest theologians to ever walk the earth, one of the greatest missionaries to ever walk the earth. He wrote Philippians 25 years after his conversion, like way way down here, right? And even Paul is saying, man, I still have to grow. I still have to move forward. And he does it in two ways, which is just so brilliant. He says, I forget what's behind me. He leaves his old man, that old sin nature, right? He says, man, I'm done with that. But not just that. He also says, I'm leaving all of my achievements, all of the good things, the things that we could easily hang, hang our hats on to say, man, I did all that right there, man. Remember that whole, man, that tour we did? That was awesome, man. Y'all want to talk about that? Y'all want to, y'all want to just, you know, just let's talk about it for a minute. Can we hang out here? No, man. He's saying, look, thank God for all of that, but I leave it in the past and I am I, my eyes are fixed on Jesus. I am moving forward. I have not arrived spiritually. I have to keep going. I have to keep moving. There's this really famous cellist, uh, maybe one of the world's greatest to ever live. His name's Pablo Casals. And um, he was a virtuoso, every note perfect, right? Just at this master level, intonation perfect. His bowing technique, absolutely perfect. He could make just the most beautiful music out of this instrument that others people, other people just dreamed about making. He was a master at it. At 95 years old, this young reporter came to him and said, Pablo, you are the greatest on the face of the earth. You can play anything you want. There's no limit to your ability. Why do you still practice six hours a day? And his answer was just so profound, and, and, and I just, I love it. He says, because I think I'm making progress. I think I'm making progress. At 95. And you know, Paul, his desire was to know Jesus 
and to become more and more like him. And he was fighting this desire just to sit back and the spiritual lazy boy and just kick it till Jesus comes back, right? No, he's saying, man, I'm straining forward. I'm moving forward. And so, yeah, I want to answer a few of these basic questions today as well. And over the weeks and months and years to come, spiritual growth is a a huge part of our DNA here. I want you to grow. I want to grow. We are going to grow. So we're going to dive into this more and more as time goes. So I just want to provide a, a quick overview today and just answer a few basic questions. Again, the why question, why grow? Why grow? You know, Jesus didn't save you, um, you know, from just simply from your sins so that he could set you up on a shelf like a Beanie Baby collection. Any of y'all collect Beanie Babies back in the day? Anybody? Some of you are like, man, I'm not, a, I'm not admitting to that. But I saw a couple of hands go up and kind of back down real quick. You didn't want to be pegged a Beanie Baby collector. But I know, I know there's a lot of people that collect the Beanie Babies. And uh, so anyway, God didn't, God didn't save you just to like set you on a shelf for, some, for a collection. He also didn't save you simply so that one day we could experience uh, this blissful moment in heaven either. Yes, he saved us for those things, but he redeemed us so that we would live fruitful and productive lives right here, right now, fulfilling the purposes of God in and through us. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 says this, his divine power, oh, I skipped it. Oh, my bad. Let me back up. Why grow? God designed us to grow. My fault. God designed us to grow. I was too fast. God designed us to grow. That's why. That's why we grow. And, and then uh, First Peter talks about it right here. So it says this, his divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness, right? Spiritual growth through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. So I I absolutely love this passage. It's it's kind of a, a mouthful. Peter's talking about, basically, here's what he's saying. He is saying that God's power saved us pretty simply put. It's God who did it. We don't save ourselves. God saved us from our sins. He gave us the ability to know him, which is just absolutely incredible and mind-blowing. He gave us these promises, right? Forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And then he allows us to partake in this divine nature through the Holy Spirit and his work in and through our lives. And then verse five, he gives us the clue. He says, for this very reason, make every effort. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly effect, brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing growth, They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, not growth, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, we are called to grow. God's designed us to grow. He desires for us to grow. You could summarize this whole passage right here simply like this. God saved you for this reason, grow. That's it. That's it in a a nutshell. And so uh, God designed us to grow. And then number two, why grow is this, is growth is evidence of my relationship with God. It's an evidence that I'm in relationship with God. And so carrying on in verse nine, it says this, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. I mean, dang, Peter, he's going for the jugular here. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, if, if I don't see growth, if I don't see progression in my life, if I can't look back and see my life changing, I once was this, I'm no longer that, man, alarm bells should be going off. 
something is wrong. And what Peter is saying is like, man, maybe you have forgotten that you have been forgiven of your sins. I love that, man. So growth, why grow? God designed us to grow. He expects us to grow. Number two, it's an evidence of my walk and my relationship with Jesus. And if you were to sit back and take inventory of your life, man, where are we? Where are we in this in this journey? And what's our next step? The next section I kind of want to talk through is simply this, man, what does spiritual growth look like? It's like, okay, Matt, I get it. I want to grow. What, what does spiritual growth look like? Well, s- simply put, becoming more like Jesus. That's what spiritual growth is. That's what it looks like. Jesus is the model. When you open up the New Testament and you open up the Gospels, you want to look at his life. He is the model. And so you want to ask simple questions like this. What did Jesus do? That's what I'm going to do. What were Jesus' rhythms in his life? Those are going to be my rhythms in life. How did he treat people? That's how I'm going to treat people. What did, what did he do? How did he, how did he live? What, you know, what are these things? What was his attitude towards people? What was his character like? Man, that's, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to be like. If you open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, you're going to see in, chap- in verse 22, the, uh, it's a list of the fruit of the Spirit. And what's really, really cool is that when Jesus was on the earth, he was filled by the Spirit, and, and the, Spirit, the, the fruit of the Spirit were, was in full operation at a perfect level in the life of Jesus. And the cool thing is, is you and I, we have that same Holy Spirit in us as well. And so if you ever wanted to know what it looks like in a list form, what did Jesus look like, man, this is it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? That agape love that we've talked about a bunch, right? Choosing the good for somebody regardless of what you get in return. Joy, man, being just joyful in the fact that I have a relationship with him. Peace, Jesus is at perfect peace all the time. Patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against these things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. I love that, man. Absolutely love that. Y'all remember being a line leader in elementary school? I always wanted to be a line leader, desperately wanted to be the line leader. I knew when the water break, you know, water fountain break was coming, and I just, man, I just kind of just sat up a little bit straighter. I was trying to get picked. I never got picked. Nobody, I don't know, teachers didn't want me to be the line leader, man. I wanted it, though, but it just never happened. They always gave it to the goody two-shoe kids that were just, like, paying attention and not causing uh, problems, you know. And so, man, I was never the line leader. But, you know, keeping in step with the Spirit, you know what that simply means? That means getting in line. That means he's my leader right there, and I'm following. And I'm holding up my three fingers because I'm being quiet or whatever it was back then, right? Like, like he's my leader. I'm following him. I'm in step with him. Our lives need to look less and less like ourselves. That's that old self, sin nature, and more and more like Jesus. And I'm telling you, man, that is so counterculture to everything that we are fed. Right now, culture is saying, hey, find your identity in whatever makes you happy. What, whatever makes you happy. Man, you want to be this? Do it. Oh, you don't want to be that anymore? That's fine. Go over here and do it. And what ends up happening is people are on this constant pursuit of just looking for something that's going to give them fulfillment. Whatever makes you happy, do it. And the kingdom of God is like, no, deny yourself. Disown yourself. Take up your cross every single day and come and follow me. That is spiritual growth and that is spiritual formation. So that's it. And then how do we grow? A couple of little thoughts here as as we progress through this. Number one is this. How do we grow? Man, growth, first of all, is the work of God. Growth is the work of God in your life. And we see that in that same passage, kicking back up to verse 3. It says that his divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. 
Okay, that's important. It's God that provides everything that we need for spiritual growth. Growth doesn't come from my abilities. Growth comes from God. It's God and the Holy Spirit working in and through me. It's the the foundation of, of spiritual transformation and formation is his power. And we got to, we have to remember that. You know, John 15, uh, I was thinking about teaching through that for this, for this message because it's just so good. Uh, but this is what it says as it relates to that. Jesus is talking. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nada. That's Spanish for nothing, for those of you guys who don't know. Uh, you can do absolutely nothing apart from him. And that touches in every aspect of our life. It's not just the churchy stuff that we can't do, man. Man, he allows it. He allows the things that we do. And man, as we're growing and as we're progressing on this this journey, this faith journey, we cannot, down the road, when we finally got our hands around some things, begin to think that you did it. Man, I did this. You point your finger and say, well, at least I'm not like that person. I'm so glad I'm so much more spiritually mature than them. You you see that movie, uh, Tom Hanks, with with Tom Hanks, it's uh, Castaway. I love that movie. Absolutely amazing movie. He's on the beach. He's been working on that fire, trying to get fire going. He's cold. He wants to dry off. He finally gets that massive fire going. He's like, I have made fire. You remember that moment? It's, It's amazing. I love it. But that's what we can't do when it comes to our spiritual journey. And you think about it, it's like, well, Tom, you, you didn't really create it because God created the, the wood and oxygen and combustion and fire and, and energy and all those things. And so actually he did it. And so we just got to be careful to understand that everything is, is laid and built upon the foundation of God's power working in and through us. But number two, or not but, in addition to that, is that growth requires our participation. Growth requires us to get involved. It requires us to, to obey and do the things that God has laid out for us to do to follow his commands, to follow his leadings, to follow his principles. Do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? I want to grow. We have to do what he says to do. James 1 talks about that, verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Coming and listening to me preach isn't enough. It's not enough. Hearing, listening to a podcast on your phone, isn't enough. It's good, yes, absolutely good, essential, yes, but it is not the end-all be-all. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Man, we got to do it, y'all. Simply put, just do it, man. Let's, let's get after it. If we want to grow, it's God's power working in us combined with, with our participation and, and us following his command. So a couple of things wrapping up. Just real practical, man. If Just simple things. H- how do we grow? In two weeks, we're going to kick off a sermon series called Heart of Devotion, where we're going to be looking at some spiritual disciplines, and we're going to be looking at a few of these at a, at a deeper level. But man, simply put, number one, prayer. Number one, prayer. If you want to spiritually grow, you have to be in constant connection and constant communication with God. First Thessalonians talks about that, and it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. It's just this worshipful approach to Jesus and to God constantly. That I'm in constant, I'm thinking about him. I'm thanking him for my life. I'm I'm seeking his guidance. I'm seeking his counsel every moment of the day. I'm just constantly in communion with the Lord. Got to make it a discipline in our lives. Uh, Romans 12, 12 talks about it. Talks about how be consistent in prayer as well. But man, if you want to grow, you got to pray. If you want to grow, you got to pray. Number two, study God's word. Study God's word. You got to, we got to fall in love with God's word. 
I'll never forget uh, Psalms 1. I, I memorized it. went to a Christian academy out in Dallas, Texas. And so they were, they were huge on memorizing Scripture. And so Psalms 1 was one of the, the ones that we memorized. And so uh, I memorized it in King James Version because that was the only Bible back then. And so, uh, but anyways, uh, if you like King James, that's great, man. It's good. It's God's Word. So, um, but it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth, bringeth forth fruit in its season. And anything, he's, he's not going to wither. It's not going to wither. And everything he does is going to prosper. And so what we think about, what we consume, will shape our lives. But if we delight in God's word, we're going to be like a tree growing growing, producing fruit, producing fruit, you know? So you've got to fall in love with God's word. And then lastly, man, connection with other believers. Connection with other believers. Man, we, we can't grow alone. Uh, Proverbs, a very f- familiar passage, says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know, how are we going to be encouraged? How are we going to be challenged? How are we going to be held accountable if we're not in community with other believers? Hebrews 10 talks about it as well, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. We gotta, if we're going to grow, we got to gather. We have to get together. But encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Man, we cannot one another by ourselves. So let's get into Christian community. And then the last thought as as we're wrapping up is who are your growth relationships? Who are your growth relationships? Now, I talked about only having one growth relationship, but my encouragement is to have two, okay? I put underneath that upline and downline. We know what that is. We know what upline is. We know what downline is. And so there's probably somewhere, if you were to identify kind of where you're at in your faith journey, uh, maybe you're here there's always going to be somebody that's just a little bit further down the road that you see their character and, the, and what they exhibit and, and, and their, their, their growth in the Lord. And you're like, man, I want to be like that. Like, like I want to be like that, you know? And so my encouragement to you is to write that name down and go talk to them and say, hey, would you mentor me? Would you speak in a month? Can we meet once a month? Can we meet weekly? Can we get on a Zoom call and just, can you just pour into me and teach me the things that you've learned? And then downline, right? We know that there are people that are younger in faith that are in our lives. And so you recognize those people and say, man, I, I, need, I need to help them. I need to bring them under my wings, so to speak, and help them grow. So my question is, man, who, who are your growth relationships? Who are you going to intentionally engage in a relationship and become more and more like Christ? Christ.